No money to start. The hardest part of starting the business was raising money. Lost everything in the last recession. When you lose your money and you lose your friend and you lose that kind of stuff, it gives you perspective. And $2.5 million in debt. Getting off hard money is probably the best thing that anyone could ever do. Nothing stopped Jay and Mark from building an $85 million a year home building business. We find all of our properties off market. That probably accelerated our growth. Let's deep dive into the intricacies of this closely held industry. Is that 4.599 million? 4.599 million. To be successful, it's the hustle factor. It's what 99% of the people won't ever do. From getting started with no money to Mark's profit margins and his secret philosophy for a happy life. Big thanks to Constant Contact for sponsoring today's video. All right, Mark, so where are we standing and uh, what's up with this property? So we are in uh, Bellevue, Washington, just outside of Seattle. We are going to be demoing this house. It's going to ultimately be a brand new home. It's all getting torn down. It's all getting torn Today. down. Today. Okay. And we're even going to get you uh, on the tractor. All right. I've never done that before. <laughs> yeah. Going to be like a little kid again. <laughs> all right. So why are you tearing this down? Uh, so our business is that we buy tear down houses in, the, uh, in infill neighborhoods and we build new houses on top. Okay. How about your backstory? How did you get into this industry? When did you do that? I started in when I was 23 years old, started selling real estate. And a year after, my business partner and I started buying fixer houses mm -hmm. and uh, turning them into rentals. Okay. And that was like our kind of like our side gig was he, uh, my business partner, Jay, he uh, had a family furniture store. Uh, I sold real estate. We sold our DJ business that we had when we were 20 years old. Oh, nice. We made about 15 grand and took all that money and invested it into, into real estate. And that was how we got started, buying, remodeling uh, houses. Okay. By the time we were 30, we had about 30 rental houses. One of those houses had a little bit of land on it. Yeah. So we learned the land development business. So we were doing house plus a lot, house plus two lots. We ended up creating a business that was developing like projects that were upwards of about 50 lots wow. um, at a time. Oh my gosh, that's it, massive. It was, it was a pretty decent sized business. But what happened was when the recession happened, it was like a craps table and, and uh, lucky number seven came mm -hmm. and all of the rentals and all of the land uh, that we had, we had to liquidate it all to, oh, to satisfy bank debt. Wow. Uh, and the unfortunate part is when we were liquidated at all, we still owe the bank about two and a half million dollars. Oh my gosh. So he's told the bank, um, we said, hey, if you give us 20 years, mm -hmm. we'll pay you back two and a half million dollars. So bankruptcy wasn't an option? Bankruptcy wasn't an option. We paid that all off within seven years. We wanted to be men to our word. Mm -hmm. I respect that. All right, should we go in? Yeah, let's go. So, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, a brand new house could take about uh, 10, 11 months to build. This house to get torn down will be about three days and it's all gone. So give us an overview of this lot. How much did you buy it for? Anything else interesting about this place? Yeah, so this lot we paid about 920,000 for. $920,000 for a piece of junk house. <laughs> we paid $920,000 for a house that we're gonna tear down, yeah. So okay. this house will end up being 4,800 square feet and it'll sell for about 3 million. Do you know about how much profit you'll get on that? Uh, we shoot for about a 10% profit. Sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes it's a little bit less, depending on the market. So what makes this house a teardown house? Well, it's kind of like our business model is that we, like in this area right here, we're about five minutes away from Microsoft. We're about five to 10 minutes away from Amazon's uh, second campus. <laughs> we're wow. about 10 minutes away from Google's campus. That is central. Uh, it's infill properties yeah. and people want to live in close in locations. They don't want to live in the outskirts. Yeah. So they pay a premium to be in neighborhoods that uh, have great schools and are great neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And like most of these houses are built in the 50s, about 1,000 to 1,200, 1,500 square feet. And then ultimately we'll build uh, 4,000 to 4,800 square feet on top of it. Okay, and that's on what lot size do you know? These are probably anywhere from 8,500 to 10,000 square feet. Okay. So how did you find this house? Uh, well, we find all of our properties off market. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay, you heard it guys. He doesn't find his best deals on market, he finds them off market. So keep watching to find out how he does it. What are the tools or systems you use to track and manage your business expenses? Well, 
First of all, we have the best accounting team and the best CFO, Catherine. She monitors everything, you know, profit, ongoing expenses, days on market, days of construction. Like we are constantly monitoring every aspect mm -hmm. of the business. You know, how long it takes us to go from design to submit for permit. How long does it take for permitting mm -hmm. in different jurisdictions? How long does it take for us to, to build the house? We have cash flow spreadsheets that wow. can track how long or what we're gonna make you know, next year based on, you know, the sales that we have. And then once you get to a certain size of business, you have to have audited financial statements. Mm -hmm. And so we send financial statements every single quarter to the bank so that they know what, how, what our performance is. Mm -hmm. All right, Mark, where are we at now? Uh, so uh, we're with uh, Mike Thomas, one of our lead superintendents, and we're in the middle of uh, Bellevue. We're uh, closer to the city. So this is a little bit higher price point of home. Where we were at before was about $3 million. So now this house is higher about- Higher than 3 million now. What is this? <laughs> this will be about four and a half to $5 million when, when we're all signed done. square footage? Uh, this is what, how big, Mike? Uh, 5,500. 5,500 square feet. Dang. Yeah, so when we bought this property, we bought, it was one house and we divided it into two. So we built that house, finished it, and now we're uh, onto this one. Okay, well, we got our hard hats on. Is there anything I can help you uh, get into the job site? Oh yeah, we're definitely, we're gonna get a tool belt on you. A tool belt? Oh my gosh, I'm yes. getting the excavator and tool belt. All right, let's do it. What was the most challenging part of starting your business and how did you overcome that? The hardest part of starting the business was raising money to get up and going. I mean, we were- sense. It was um, middle of a recession and uh, we had never built a house before. I sent out 200 emails uh, to all the friends and people that I knew and I got zero response. Hmm. And I was deflated. I was like, these are all the people that I know. And I learned a really valuable lesson about raising money. People will not invest just from an email. People will yeah. generally not invest even in a phone call. But you get face to face. And in early on, I was like, okay, here is taking them to the job site of that the project that we bought. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like getting them visually into like into like what we were gonna do. Okay, yeah, I think that's really important. So no emails, just get them on the phone and say, can I take you out to coffee or lunch? Yeah, just get in front of them face to face. Yeah. And then having a really good plan, you have to have a plan in place. Okay. So what is that plan? What's the, when you meet with an investor, what are you talking about? My responsibility was, okay, let's create what the future is gonna look like. And so I created the business plan. It ended up being like a 56 page business plan of who is J-Mark, what are we gonna do, where are we gonna build, all of that. And like, just our goals and aspirations for a business and our culture and, and whatnot. So that was kind of like how we started the business. Like, what are the values of the company and, and what are you gonna build? And like, how are you gonna be out there in the, okay. in the world as a home builder? Yeah. How are you gonna be out there in the world with your business? Mark may have struggled with using email in the past, but guess what? He didn't have a constant contact. You may not get that big investment from a single email, but you will get the first contact done right. Oh my gosh, I just got a client, yes! Constant Contact has your back. They offer all the tools you need for smooth marketing. They have a super easy to use email editor and pre-designed templates that will help you create a standout email to get you noticed. You can send personalized messages based on customer actions, track results, and improve performance. Constant Contact also helps you post to social media effortlessly. Post to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn with just one click. You can even respond to messages and comments directly from your account. And kiss writer's block goodbye. If you provide keywords, Constant Contact's AI content generator creates engaging messages in seconds and even suggests subject lines for better open rates. Try it risk-free with their free trial. Use promo code UPFLIP2023 and get 30% off your first three months. Click the link in the description below to sign up. Thanks to Constant Contact for sponsoring today's video. And remember, the first foot in the door will make a world of difference for your business. Now let's get back to see what more can lead you to success. Okay, tell us a little bit about this home. So we are uh, about five minutes away from downtown Bellevue. We're in Bellevue. This is the Kelso. It's uh, 5,600 square feet. It's uh, 4.599. Is that 4.599 million? 4.599 million. Oh my gosh, you got Venmo or Cash out of that work? Yeah, for sure, definitely. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> right, come on in. Let's go. Welcome home. Beautiful. 
Woo. That is a $4 million home for sure. All right, first question is, how much did you initially invest to start this business? J. Mark Holmes. <laughs> Oh, Ooh. look at that, you got one in. It's a great question. So um, the last remaining assets that Jay and I had were our two luxury SUVs that we had paid mm -hmm. cash for like three years before. That's right. We bought these 10 lots mm -hmm. and uh, we had to put $100,000 down. We sold our SUVs, we made 100 grand off those SUVs. We put all of that money into, uh, as earnest money for those lots. And then I, we had to raise uh, another million dollars. We raised friends and family money for the million dollars. And, and uh, but then the construction, we got uh, hard money lenders to ultimately finance the, the building and construction. Hmm. So good shot. Uh, oh. And uh, being that we were a brand new builder, it was a recession and we had no money. We had to use hard money lenders for yeah. about Three years. Lots of lessons learned by using hard money lenders. Um, they're not all the same. I was fostering a relationship with one of the bigger banks here in Seattle, uh, Columbia Bank and, and David Adams. And he gave us our first opportunity with real financing. Mm. Uh, it took us three years to prove the business, to show them that we could build houses and sell them and that there was a formula. Ultimately, when he gave us financing, we had like a half a dozen other banks that yeah. were willing to give us financing. Cool. It just took the one bank. Yeah, you needed to prove and, it. And I'll tell you that getting off hard money is probably the best thing that anyone could ever do. Right. It's really hard. Remember that get off hard money as soon as you can. So welcome to J Mark offices. We are located on Mercer Island, uh, which is super convenient. It's five to 10 minutes away from Seattle and mm -hmm. five to 10 minutes away from Bellevue. Let's check it out. All right, welcome on in. Hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, moved into this office about a year ago. We bootstrapped our office over the course of the 12, first 12 years where you had 12 different <laughs> kinds of desks, old <laughs> carpet, old <laughs> everything. Uh, and then finally, about last year, we decided that we wanted to have an office that is all synchronized. So how do you keep so many people in line and growing in a company, company like this? We have monthly meetings and we go over what are things called rocks we follow a principle called the Rockefeller habits that kind of give us the framework for having these monthly meetings. Rockefeller. Yeah, Rockefeller okay. habits. I haven't heard of that, but hey guys, stick around. Rockefeller habits are apparently what he uses to scale his company. So stick around if you want to find out what that is. So we hear that there's waves in the real estate cycle, right? Mm -hmm, for sure. Okay, so last major economic downturn was when? Well, the last major one was 2000 and eight, nine, 10, yeah. but in between oh, eight, nine, 10, like 2018 was a tough time because mm -hmm. interest rates shot up from three and a half to five. Okay. What would be your biggest piece of advice for somebody who starts in a downturn? Maybe we're not in one right now, but how could somebody get started if that's the case? The thing that's important that I don't, I don't know if it's stressed enough is how important cash is. Amen. Because people want to like leverage and how do they can grow as fast as they yeah, can. Yeah, leverage, you hear that a lot. You hear that a lot. And what I've experienced is that your investors don't want to see this massive growth. Hmm. Like two of my investors are CFOs of, of large publicly traded companies that are based here in Seattle. And when they ask me like, okay, tell me about what your plan is, they want me to have slow and steady growth rather than something that is like shooting for the moon. And they always ask me, kind of funny-wise, how are you not gonna lose my money? And the other one is more conservative. He's like, what's your plan B? What is it that you need to know that if something happens, or what's your plan in place, so that if something happens, you have the plan in place in order to execute and help save the business. Yeah. But every single one of those is making sure that you have enough cash. How do you discuss the risks with the investors? I always tell investors that we are gonna be world-class operators. We're gonna do our best to build a house, then be profitable and do it as, as fast as we possibly can and make as much money as possible. The challenge is the macroeconomics. You know, you don't know that there's gonna be a pandemic. You don't know when there's gonna be inflation and interest rates go up. And so our job in the real estate business is to ride the waves up and to ride mm -hmm. the waves down. And so I just tell them like, I can control everything except for what's happens in the macroeconomics. Okay. All right, Mark, what is this beautiful home? Well, I want to invite you guys to my house. 
Ooh. And I think that we've told you the story and the journey of, of J Mark. Mm -hmm. And it's important for people that are viewing this to really understand like the power of manifestation, the power of goal setting. One of the things that's been really important for me over the course of the last 30 years is setting goals and intentions about what I want out of my life. And so 2010, had not had, didn't have a paycheck. I wrote out the goal, you know, my dream home, and this is what my dream home would look like. I would have this view, I would have this kind of kitchen, I would have that, the TV room, and why would I want it? I want it because I want to entertain. I love to have people here, and it really in, in, in empowers me. And so I didn't know how that was gonna manifest, but in 2012, I found this piece of property while we were door knocking or while we were walking, driving street by street. I brought my wife here in 2012 and said, this is my dream piece of property. We made an offer on this property five years in a row until finally one day, while we were in the middle of building another house, they said, we're ready to sell. And so I brought my wife onto this deck and I showed her the view. She's like, let's do it. That was the manifestation of, of living here. It wasn't that long ago that Jay and I didn't have any money and we didn't know where our paycheck was gonna come from. You know, when you think about, you know, just any goal that you have in life and, and it ultimately being able to happen, mm -hmm. like I'm grateful every day when I come down here and go, this is where I, I get to live. Yeah, yeah, well, thanks for sharing your story. That's inspiring. All right, we got blitz questions. You got 10 seconds to answer each of these questions. All right, fair enough. So here we go. Abdul asks, what method do you use to manage a lot of tasks? I look at my tasks from a week standpoint. And so I like, okay, what are all the things I want to accomplish for the week? And then I start plugging it into my uh, calendar of getting those accomplished. Good job. Tabibu asks, Thanks. how do you deal with increasing cost of materials? It all has to do with relationships with the subcontractors. Is like when the pricing were going up, you, we were asking the subcontractors, okay, what is another alternative to that particular item? Okay. So that they were giving us suggestions of like, hey, this is where you could change this window package or go to this kind of appliance package. And last question from Sergi is, how do you handle stress in life? I try to keep a really balanced approach to, uh, to life, where my life is not all about business. Okay, good job, you did it. Thanks. All right, what's the biggest thing that you have learned from losing it all? Having my own definition of success. I think that we grew that business to have a thousand lots. And that thousand lots was sheer like, pure ego, like a thousand, I, there was no sound business plan from it. But I wanted to prove that I could be that person or be somebody. And in reality, I didn't need to be that person. Mm -hmm. It was my ego that was driving that, that goal. Mm -hmm. From then on, it was, okay, have a sound business plan. How can somebody get away from chasing that ego? I think it starts with perspective and the things that are really important in life. And I think that for me, I wanna be the best husband, the best father, the best leader. Like those are the things that are, I think, really important. And I think deep down, when you lose your money and you lose your friend and you lose that kind of stuff, it gives you perspective. Mm -hmm. And too many people realize it way too late in their life. All right, so tell us a little bit about marketing. So we're a luxury brand and our marketing plan is just all about the experience for our clients. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we spend a lot of money to have amazing model home yeah. so that people can come here and really experience what it's like to live in a J-Mark mm -hmm. home. And the experience when they walk into the door, mm -hmm. we have their houses open uh, seven days a week. And we have someone that's in, that's a sales rep that all they do is sell J-Mark homes. Wow. And so when the client comes in, whether they're relocating from California or Texas, they're greeted with somebody. They're able to talk about the brand, talk about the house, and really just give them the feel of like what it's like to work with J-Mark. And it's just like little things like, you know, we have our own J-Mark chocolate where, oh, you know, we get about 500. Snag one of those. Yeah, for sure. We, make, we get about 500 pounds of those a year and, and it's just like leaving them with something sweet so that they yeah. remember J-Mark. Yeah. But really, it's just about a feeling that they would have from being in one of our homes. And once they have that feeling, you have them hooked. The house sells itself. It's then like, okay, 
Tell me about the builder. Tell me about the experience that you're gonna have after you move in. Every experience that a client has, you just want it to exude your brand, whether it's uh, your website, you know, it's like, okay, how does that look and feel that is exemplifying your, mm -hmm. your brand? Or social media, you know, what are the things that you're putting out there so that people can really get a sense of who you are? And so it's kind of like we have an overall essence of who we are, and so we just cater our marketing to them. Okay. Hey, if you want to hear some more insights on another important part of home building, which is land development, and learn how you can take $300 and scale it up to $70,000 like Seth Williams did, go listen to episode 15 of the Upflip podcast and you won't regret it. Is it important to pick a niche and what is your niche? Well, our niche is, is one, we are luxury home builders in an infill market. And so we don't deviate much from us being a luxury brand. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not gonna then go build a lower end project. Yeah. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> but when you have a niche and you know it backwards and forwards, like we know street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood, we know who the buyers are, we know who the That's agents right. are, we know, you know, we know what things are selling for. We know, we know all of the details associated with our particular niche, but someone coming into our niche would be like a fish out of water. We know them backwards and forwards. We know what we can pay for land. We know what we can sell it for. We know what we can, wow. the construction costs. We know all the things that belong in the house. When you try to expand what it is that you do, you don't have that inherent knowledge. And so you pay something called the dumb tax. <laughs> it's like the dumb tax of learning the business until you actually become profitable. Okay, aim at everything, hit nothing. <laughs> That's smart, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> How long did it take for you to become profitable in the business? We were profitable the first year or two that was in the business. Jay and I didn't take a paycheck for like two or three years. We reinvested all of our money back into the business and hiring people to help us grow. That probably accelerated our growth just by sheer like compromising. So that's crazy. How do you and Jay even work together like that? You know, keep in mind that as of today, this will be 33 years of us being business partners and he has been the best business partner I could possibly imagine and he will grind he will be relentless in the pursuit of any goals that we set and he lets me dream a big dream he lets me think about the vision and the culture and the mm -hmm. strategy he just gets shit done that's his uh, job title is chief do a lot <laughs> that's great what's your average revenue look like in a month well, home building, it's not in any specific months because it's, it's, it, it kind of is staggered. Yeah. Um, it is about $85 million and that combines the for sale side of the business and the custom mm. home side of the business. Okay. We have two parts of our business, one that we build for sale and one families come to us and they want a, us to build homes on their property. Mm -hmm. Which one of those two is most profitable? Ebbs and flows, but they're about the same. Uh, really? custom, custom takes more people, but they have about the same kind of profit margin at the mm -hmm. end. Yeah, okay. So two main pillars of business, all right. Two main pillars, yeah. What profit margins do you normally see from that revenue? It depends on the year. Oh, come on. It's, it's the honest to God truth is that, you know, in the recessionary times, you're hoping to get a 5% profit. Mm -hmm. In a normal year, just a regular year, it's about 10%. When it is booming, it could be 17%. And when it is like through the roof, it could be 27%. Mm -hmm. And I think that in a 10 year timeline, you touch all of those profit margins. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. So what's the best way to grow revenue in this business? Is it just a matter of finding investors and finding properties or how do you grow? It's kind of all intertwined. You, you need properties, uh, you do need investors. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the primary uh, is growing a business that requires people. Creating a great culture so that people wanna work for us, um, empowering okay. them to do great work yeah. and then taking really good care of them. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's kind of like, yes, you need to have a strategy for acquiring land uh, and you need to have a strategy for having investors want to participate, but really the key is people. Okay. How did you find investors in the beginning? You need to meet investors before you need them. And it's fostering relationships, uh, whether they're friends, family, other entrepreneurs, and you, you build trust with them. And so when it is comes time that you have an idea, you're not just going there and needing them, you're going there and saying, hey, I have this idea, is this something that you would be interested in? Mm -hmm. And so too often, like people need to find investors at the last minute, <laughs> and it's like, that's the worst time because no investors wants to feel yeah. that stress. Yeah. They want to have time to look it over and make a decision. Mm -hmm. 
What are the main skills that are needed in this business and why? Yeah, you know, it, it ultimately is about hiring the right people and not having turnover. Uh, because, you know, people don't realize that turnover is one of the biggest expenses that you could have. And if you have a team that is happy, they come to each house over and over again. They know our systems, they know our processes, yeah. they know how we work. It makes things so much easier. When you have to train a new subcontractor based on what you do, like it, it makes it more difficult. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes for employees, is when you have an employee that is with you for five years, for 10 years, they become more efficient and they do end up doing more work. And so mm -hmm. the skill is really just all about the people and how you can become a better leader in, in the process of growing your business. Okay. When did you gain those skills or how did you learn them? Well, I think failure has an uh, incredible opportunity for learning. And I think I, I grew the last business. I was leading more from my ego versus letting other people have the control. Yeah. And I think that was probably the greatest, one of, one of the biggest lessons that I learned is how do I let go of control mm -hmm. and letting and empowering other people to, to do what they do best. Yep. Yeah, delegation. Delegation and empowerment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have a lot of cubicles, a lot of offices going on here. So yep. how many employees are we talking? We have about 45 employees, about uh, 30 are in the office and about 15 are out in the field. 30 and 15, okay, cool. Can you talk us through your hiring process and how do you find great employees? Well, first of all, we hire, uh, generally almost everyone here has been recommended by somebody else in the organization. We create a culture where people want to come work here. And, and when they're here, they want to tell their friends to come. And so we have people that have left companies that have been there for 20 years, and then they come here and they hang their hat and this is where they want to be mm -hmm. for the rest of their, so cool. their work life. And so it's a process, but that's kind of how we go about it. Okay. So before you mentioned that you don't find any of your best deals on the market, you, you find them off the market. What does right. that mean? Over the course of our 30 years of doing real estate, we've learned the valuable lesson of driving street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood, and writing mm -hmm. down the houses that we think are the best opportunities. Really? Wow. Because you can't, like here's an example. This house right here that we're tearing down was a rental house and it was not well taken care of. This house right here looks like someone lives there, brand new roof, and it's and it's really nice. Yeah. It's, it's relatively nice. When you drive street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood, you know every single house and you know like, okay, that one's a rental, that yeah. one's dilapidated, that one's not well taken care of. And so what we've done is we've gone city by city, neighborhood by neighborhood, and we've spent probably thousands and thousands of hours really indexing properties and we know which house we want to buy and we foster relationships with all wow. of those landowners. That's to be successful, it's the hustle factor. Mm -hmm. It's what 99% of the people won't ever do. We want to control price, but we also want to control terms. Mm -hmm. See, when you buy on market, there are bidding wars and so yeah. you don't want to be a part of that when you're when this is your business, you mm -hmm. wanna be the one that controls it. Yeah. And I'm not to say that we don't have other builders that we compete against that are looking for these properties, but we're competing against maybe one other builder, mm -hmm. not could be up to 10 people looking for a teardown or mm -hmm. fix your property. So you've been talking about company culture, so tell us about what makes your company great. One, it's the first week. When people come and work for JMark, we're not having them go out in the field, we're not having them do work, we're actually introducing them to everyone on our staff. And so they get to know each and every person, what they do, and then they, they have a sense of belonging. They start to feel like part of it. They start to feel like family. And it's like that first week is so important to how people think and feel about the company that they work at. So number two is we have everyone read the book, Exceptional Service, Exceptional Profit. After that, what happens is we do what's called a naming ceremony. And it's a rite of passage. And what ends up happening is we, we list all the adjectives for that particular person. Hardworking, charismatic, energizing, um, fun. And you could go your entire career without ever hearing adjectives of like what people think of you. In, in, and so you do that within 90 to 120 days of being at JMark. And then after that, we go through a naming ceremony. 
and people have nominations. You can get like 40, 50 different nominations. And at the end, we kind of vote mm -hmm. for which one is the right nomination. Wow. It becomes really cool. And there, it, these are like the pseudo names of, for, our, uh, for our team. So the third thing that I, we think that is one of the valuable parts of JMark is it's an exit party. So when we have team members that decide that they want to leave and they want to pursue other interests or, or go to work for another company, we celebrate them. Mm -hmm. And so we always will have a party for them. And, wow. and we tell them how much they meant to us at JMark. You know what's crazy is that 10% of our workforce, over 10%, have left and then come back. Really? And that, that kind of like reaffirms is like when people leave, yeah. The grass isn't always greener, or yeah. the extra five, you know, extra dollar mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily worth it to leave because you have this and oh. the company and the culture. That's a really good sign. Cool. Can you talk us through the design process for a new home? Uh, well, the design process really has to do with the lot that we buy. We start with okay, what is what can you put on this piece of property and. Uh, in the future, what would it sell for? And so the formula that we usually use is about a third of the property is land, a mm. third of the property is about construction costs, and a third of the property is financing, marketing, sales mm. costs, and ultimately, you know, the profit that you make. Yeah. And so, and then when you design the specific house, it's kind of like the features and benefits that a buyer would want, you know, like the outdoor patio, a massive, you know, kitchen like this that's open to the great room. Like these are all things that, you know, people want. They want the open floor plan. They want yeah. the ability to have the, it's beautiful. to be able to have uh, indoor, outdoor living um, and, you know, outdoor barbecue, fireplace. It makes it where it's, you know, families want to be. Mm -hmm. What information do you need to get from customers when they contact you and you, before you begin the design process? Yeah, so for the custom home part of our business, which is about 50%, families come to us and they, own their land and they come to us and say, okay, what can we build here? And what we try to do is say, okay, here is a portfolio of 100 houses. Of the 100 houses, these are about the five to eight that fit on your lot. Mm -hmm. And it's based on square footage, it's based on their price point. And so we kind of guide them down a path of uh, designing a house that is already in our portfolio. Okay, how many people choose that portfolio design? There's probably about uh, two or three because we have our in-house architectural team that would kind of guide them down that path of like which houses would fit. And then they ultimately pick what houses that they like, which exterior design, and or I like this exterior design, but mm -hmm. this floor plan. Mm -hmm. And so then you intermix, you kind of can intermix okay. the two. Nice. So you mentioned the Rockefeller habits mm -hmm. earlier. Yes. Um, can you go more into detail about what that is and how it's helped you grow your company? Sure. The Rockefeller habits is a structure that guides your business to future growth and then works backwards to the present day. Okay. And so what it is, is it's a one page business plan that talks about your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It then kind of shows you, okay, what are you going to do for the year? You know, what are you gonna do in three years as far as your goals as the company? Like, where do you wanna go in the future? It brings it to, okay, what are you gonna do for the year? What are the goals? Here's our 2023 goals that we tell everyone that this is what we're looking to accomplish. We wanna do this many for sale houses, we wanna do this many custom homes, and this is our goal as a culture. Our cultural goal is to come together, hold each other accountable uh, as a work, uh, as a team, and, uh, and, and I think that kind of exudes the entire essence of our company, is that we're all here working together to accomplish the goals. And then it breaks down into what, what are things called rocks. Rocks are, what are the things that you're gonna do on the business Working on the business versus in the business, you guys have heard that before. So working on the business are just things that are gonna help improve it to take it to the next level. Yeah. Every single month, our company talks about our rocks. Where are we gonna go? How are we gonna get there? And every department reports on their rocks two times a quarter. Okay. And every quarter, we talk about the progress. We talk about our successes. And then the next month, we talk about what does the future quarter look, gonna look like? Okay, in a team meeting or they submit in a, a report? In, no, in a team meeting. Okay. So everyone is like constantly oh, nice. sharing yeah. what it is that they're doing. And it's kind of like a bragging session <laughs> of like, okay, here's what we accomplished that. for the particular quarter. And that's where you create a, a, a culture of everyone is accountable to everyone else. Mm -hmm. Because you hear like, hey, I wanna accomplish X. 
in my department, and then they run with it for the quarter. Yeah, okay. All right, so you've won a few really important awards, uh, such as NHQ, Golden Nugget, uh, Best of America, is that right? Yeah, those are some of the awards that we've won. And National Housing Quality Award is, is one where it took us 10 years to finally get to a place where we could apply. The application took us about six months to fill out. And uh, they brought a team of people uh, to come and interview our employees, interview our Products. clients, and uh, interview our vendors. And at the end, we were recognized as being one of the best operators in the country uh, wow. based on that award. Congratulations. Um, yeah, thank you. It, it, it was really a great accomplishment for the team. The second award, Best in American Living and the Gold Nugget, those are both for design. And we've won national awards for the design of the homes that we've built. And that's always amazing to be recognized to be some of the best of the best. But the one that we're most proud of is um, the House Award, and House is uh, for customer service. Uh, we've been one top one percent of home builders across the country for providing uh, best customer service seven years in a row, mm -hmm. and so that's the one that I think the team really rallies behind. We, you know, we really cater towards providing amazing customer service. Mm -hmm. So how can businesses get these kind of awards and what's their benefit beyond just bragging rights? Yeah, you have a philosophy as a company. You know, for us, we're aspiring to be world-class. It's from a design standpoint, it's from an operational standpoint, and it's from a service standpoint. And so when the entire company knows that that's who we are and that's that, that embodies, wow. it's like we're always striving to be the best of the best. It's really about doing good work and there's an application process with every single one of them. Mm -hmm. You also run a webinar series, is that right? Yeah, we have a webinar series that talks about how to build a custom home. Oh wow, okay, why'd you start doing that? Uh, we started it uh, kind of during the pandemic. Uh, before the pandemic, we would have once a month open houses where people would come to an open house and we would share, talk to them about you know, how to build a custom home and the pitfalls of building a custom home. Mm -hmm. And then during the pandemic, we couldn't have the open houses anymore. And, and what we ended up doing was we started doing it virtually. Mm -hmm. and where we would get 20 to 30 people that came to our open house once a month, we were now getting 20 to 30 people that would be on the virtual every single week. Wow. And so then it became where- That's ridiculous. Yeah, we had, you know, it, we had probably, we have six different classes or six different things, eight different things that we talked to them about. We like Custom Home 101, we talk about interior design, we talk about feasibility, we have architects on there, we talk about financing. And so it's like you encompass everything associated with custom homes and people show up every single Wednesday and learn learn about how to build a home. So post pandemic, is that still working? People are still joining a lot? Yeah, it's it has been one of the best marketing things that we've done wow. and we just do it consistently. Wow, okay, and where can people find that webinar if they wanna go? On our check website, it out? yeah, jmarkholmes.com and they're gonna, they're gonna be able to find it soon. It's gonna be on okay. YouTube, but right now it's, oh, uh, cool. right now you can find and, and uh, learn all about it on our website. So you offered this free, but what's the benefit for you? Well, what ultimately happens is when you teach people and uh, they ultimately trust you more and you, they become like a, a trusted advisor in this particular industry. And um, you know, ultimately we grow our business based on education and um, they respect and they look forward to those series and, and ultimately um, they wanna build a custom because they know us and they like us yeah. and trust us. And that's a wrap. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Before you go, make sure to check out our other interview with Thatch Wynn, who used his experience as a real estate agent to grow an $800,000 per month real estate investment group like this guy did. I hope to see you guys in the next episode. Thatch is my boy. Go see it. <laughs> <laughs>